is the analysis recap for episode 24. The ending where Subaru is self-sacrificed. That's right. He went out like a hero. Julius and Felix didn't want to do it. And we're thinking, when is the next checkpoint going to be? Oh my god, is it going to be Appa guy? Oh my god, are we going to have to subjugate the whale? No. Makes no sense, right? We got two episodes left. Think about it. How does it make sense to kill the whale again? Thank goodness. This is basically the group huddle where we're thinking about what is the plan to go take down the witch's cult. So, we have a new thing called Possession. The name is not as tuny as I thought. I thought that he would add a little bit more extra words to make it super cool and edgy. But basically, amongst the cult members, there is this power to kind of implant one soul to another. Each body is like a vessel. Possession. If you think about it, is the way that we awaken Satala or like unseal her a similar thing? Because it doesn't sound like she has a material flesh body. But the soul is somewhere sealed. Therefore, if we unseal it, implant the soul into the body. But I thought the whole point of possession here is only specific members can get it, right? The fingers can because not every cult members can. The fingers can because I'm going to assume they have a higher degree of the witch's love, the miasma on them. And that's why Subaru can also turn into Betrugus, right? Or rather, Betrugus takes over his body because that body has all the witch's miasma. I don't think Amelia has any. Or at least no one has ever mentioned it. So who knows exactly how they're going to place Satala into Amelia. But we did learn in this episode that her body is indeed a vessel. There is a very interesting thing that happens where Subaru says, Hey, by the way, I too can get possessed. And in any other timeline where we haven't shown them the heroic deeds, they wouldn't trust this guy, right? They'd be like, holy shit, are you the witch's cult too? Are you a secret agent? But thanks to Subaru's hero deeds, more people are going to be more lenient towards him rather than completely question his authority. Like in the past, where we tell them the details of, oh, witch hunt is going to happen here. They're going to fucking attack us. But they asked, how do you know that, right? So this is a nice thing that's happening. And then Amelia, bro, this is so sad. Amelia, and, and recently, it's just so depressing seeing Amelia. Cause she just like in the shadows and just like sleeping and depressed and all she's doing is getting discriminated and i'm like oh man and what does puck do puck offers nothing but say just keep doing you amelia i don't know what the point of puck is at this point you're not really a mental support you're i mean puck just exists as a fucking battery for like super op ice magic maybe puck wants amelia to find her own answer and if you think of it from like a metagame perspective doesn't make sense for this great spirit to bail out Amelia every time. Just like how Reinhardt is gone for off-call duty, whatever it was, right? And how Roswell is now gone to the officials in the kingdom and now going to the sanctuary. You notice how, like, the important OP people that could bail us out are always gone, removed from the story? First of all, of course, because it'd be boring if they fucking clutched again. But second, you know, there may be a different reason. And right now, Puck... I guess Puck just wants Amelia to grow the uh, hard way. Who exactly knows? This part? <laughs> Dude, the letter? On Cruz Shama's behalf, right? I received a blank letter from her yesterday. There is something so weird about this blank letter. It happened last time too. At the end of the whale subjugation, before we died, we were supposed to send a messenger. But apparently the messenger was technically a letter. I don't know how that works, but okay. The messenger sent a letter. I thought that like a person was going to show up and say we're good. But a messenger has sent the blank letter yet again from Crucia's side. What does this mean? <laughs> I don't know. The blank letter literally means it could be a declaration of war. One could interpret it like that. Is there someone trolling from our side? That doesn't make sense. Is there a spy from our side? Someone that intentionally didn't want this to happen? Does that make sense? Maybe. Maybe there is someone within Crucia's side that's actually a hidden spy, some sort of rat. And therefore, the messenger did this to create... I, I don't know, conflict? I, 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 other than that, I, I don't really know why this blank letter isn't showing up. It can't be a mistake. It's being sent with ill intent? Who knows, man. 
Right. And then we're going to talk about bringing the villagers out. Emilia asked about why Krush would help this much. But the magic rocks, right? Roswell has special magic rocks near here, right? The mining rights in the Elior Forest. This part's kind of funny. <laughs> Where Wilhelm says, do you understand? It sounds like he's talking down to a child that doesn't understand how like diplomacy and politics works, negotiations. He's like, do you get this little girl? And yes, Amelia does indeed get this. The sanctuary gets mentioned here. I will lead the other half to safety in the sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? We've never heard of it. I think this is the first time we're learning about it. Roswell is headed to the sanctuary. And most likely, we're going to see what the sanctuary actually is in second season, huh? I mean, what is a sanctuary? A place of... It's a safe space. It's like a protected space. Ram is leading the other half of the villagers to the sanctuary, so... Okay. Who knows why Roswell went to the kingdom to meet the officials and directly went to the sanctuary, but... Remember, according to Biko's lines... Roswell's know what he's doing. Even though I think he's a crazy motherfucker. Even if I think that all his actions are so counterintuitive and is always leaving Amelia alone and just somehow Natsuki Subaru clutches, like, Roswell is perfectly fine. He doesn't care. He'll do his own thing. Everything's going to his plan. And I'm like, all right, bro. I need to... If we don't get Roswell explanation in season two, I'm going to be upset, bro. I want to know. What is he doing? Yep, Roswell's heading there right now. Isn't there something strange about this? Like it's too uh, well coordinated? That's right. Natsuki Subaru appears in his mystery robe. So this robe, Roswell weaves magic spells into it so that people who seize them with the robe can't really know who their identity is. It's the same robe that Amelia used in the villages too, right? Because she doesn't want to be shown in public with her you know, silver hair and half-elf presence due to the discrimination. This is the robe that she threw at us out of anger in the beginning of Arc 3, but hey, it's kind of like working in our favor. Betty is refusing to leave the mansion, and she has a contract, right? Betty has a contract with Roswell, I think, to protect the hidden library. I don't know exactly why, right? There must have been some incentive. Who knows exactly what kind of content are in the Forbidden Library? Wonder if there's Gospels in the Forbidden Library. Let's think about that, actually. Hold up. Lately, the whole theme of Gospels, and we learned more about the Gospel this episode. It sounds like the Gospel is like a set of instructions from the way that Betrugus talks about it. Forbidden Library. Books. Gospel's a book. Does Betty have Gospels in here? Why would have Betty have Gospels? Gospels are specific to the Witch's Cult. So, I don't know. Probably doesn't make sense, but... Betty is protecting this library against the feds in case the Lolicon Dojins will ever get exposed. He's, she's doing Roswell's bidding. Yeah, library is a safe space. It's not like people can even find it, right? And even if they do, Betty is so strong. I don't think she's in really any danger. In any of those runs in Arc... Like, like in the earlier runs, do you think Betty dies? Maybe at the very end, I mean, Puck is trying to destroy the world and who knows what's going on with Reinhardt versus Puck, but Betty, I don't think has ever, like, I think she's pretty much chilling, right? Like the cult members attack. We've never really seen Betty's like corpse because she's just hiding out in the library. And then here, I'm on your side and yours alone. Just do what you want, Leah. More confirmation that Puck truly has no advice for Amelia and wants Amelia to figure it out how her, like herself. I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but I guess it makes Amelia more independent. Who really knows? The kids. This is a heartfelt moment, huh? The heartfelt moment with the kids not being racist because everyone, you know, hates Amelia due to her just her being existing, right? A half elf witch. I know that she's not, but she is still a half elf. Petra and the kids. They give Amelia some. Level of, I don't know, comfort. They're all reaching out. It's so nice. See, Emilia isn't the half-devil. She's nice. The kids haven't been completely, you know, brainwashed and fed this, like, propaganda. Which is honestly not even a propaganda, right? It's just, it's wrong. It's like, Satala, just destroying the world did happen to Lord. But to lash out on this girl is a bit much, right? It also doesn't really help for her to have this hair, though. Has she ever thought about dyeing her hair? 
I'm surprised Amelia has never thought about dyeing her hair, wearing a wig, a hat, going bald. Something to hide her silver hair, but... I don't know. Maybe uh, she has some sort of pride and doesn't want to get rid of her silver hair. Mm, I don't know. This is a Meteor, right? So these are the other fingers and the cult members. The Meteor, I think... This is some sort of clock? I'm not completely sure, but I think that the way that Super was talking about, about how they understood... Is that a makeup... Was that a makeup mirror? I thought this is some sort of like... Clock or way to figure out what time it was. Because there's a talk about how there's like a two hour gap. Is it just actually a mirror? I mean, it does look... It, I mean, yeah, of course. Like, look at it, right? It's got a lens, right? It does look like a mirror, but I thought that maybe it's some sort of crystal rock shit that tells him like... The day of the time. Is this a cult member just wearing a human suit? How? No. It's a cult member's soul possessing this body, right? Because this person... Are you guys fucking capping? You guys are saying it's a fucking mirror. Someone's actually saying it's communicating. What? You motherfuckers are all just gaslighting. Anyways, it's a media. They're, they're communicating. They understand what's going on. Subaru shows up with our group and again... To their perspective, imagine how ridiculous this is. Natsuki super with a genius strategist to happen to know exactly what was going to happen, right? Two hours. You gave your buddies a schedule that was two hours behind. And then we're going to crush the fingers whose location we know. Everything is so good. And it just probably feels so unfair that Subaru is like 10 steps ahead. But of course he is. He suffered. It's not like he was just given these. He suffered and learn from it, and now he's, you know, making advantage of it. But it's always just fun to think about the perspective from other people and how they perceive Natsuki Subaru as the runs continue, the successful ones. Wilhelm says good luck, and, you know, he leaves. I'm kind of sad that we don't get more Wilhelm, but hey, he's pretty much done all the work he needed. Maybe he'll show up in the finale, maybe not, but it sounds like it's more of the Julius Showtime. Here, we get up more of the robe lore, right? You can see a lot of the times Emilia was uh, wearing the robe outside. Now, just because you wear the robe doesn't mean your entire presence is just gone, right? Because like, look, Subaru and Emilia, they're interacting together, right? Just because she has the robe on doesn't really mean that he doesn't know who she is, but maybe you have to put the robe further down and cover your eyes and that's how it, the complete negation works. I thought that like two random strangers, they wouldn't know, but like you could see earlier on, Emilia and Subaru are not random strangers either. In the, in the mansion, Subaru was robed and Emilia didn't know. Maybe she had some suspicions, but she didn't know. So I'm not sure exactly what mode, like do you have to fully put the poncho over your head? Who knows, but very convenient tool. This part was pretty funny. So this is like how we overcame Ram. Because Ram was waiting for us with the Genjutsu shit. But in this time, we had signs that showed her that, hey, the letter, our fault, chill, chill, we good. Mimi and, you know, Subaru holds the sign up there. Ram is good. The speech, we got, our, we got on our fucking knees and said sorry or apologies and saying, please do this. Ram, looking down on Subaru, probably thinking that he's a fucking dog. The fake village chief and the fake village, you know, chief's wife. There's some funny lore there. This guy is the Archbishop of... Pride, he's faking being the fake village leader by faking the dementia. Other people put him up there thinking, oh man, this probably this guy probably has five years left to live. Let's just let him, you know, assume the position. But no, he threw away his pride to become this. So I think thematically it makes sense. No, it's not. I think it's fun to think about it like that, though. Uh, the map. They didn't show us exactly too much how important this map was, but the map was shown throughout here and there, along with the media that the fingers had. So the map kind of allows us to know exactly where they are, you know, where to hit. Mimi and TV cute as all hell as usual, and Otto shows up. Finally, Otto is back. Uh, I don't know exactly what his purpose is. He drives a carriage. He's a merchant. Other than that, he seems to be kind of important to the story because he shows up again. Subaru says the funniest shit of like, oh, you know, fi finally you show up. I love how sometimes Subaru just like talks to people in this world as if they're straight up NPCs in like a 
actual game, right? Oh, it's about time you showed up. Oto's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? But thanks for saving me. It's like, nah, don't worry about it, bro. You're here now. The gang's all ready. Things are looking good. What the fuck was this? And like, what is these ruins? So is this just like their hideout? What is this place? I'm not completely sure what the meaning of these ruins are. I thought they were doing some sort of research in there. We just happened to find them. But I'm just going to assume that this is where Petrogus and his fingers are just hiding. The place where they play twist. Oh, true, true, true. Yeah, the time that Subaru did actually did exit out of the ruins, right? With Re uh, Rem's body. This is that place. Okay, I thought that... This is some sort of specific ancient ruins that they're doing some sort of fucking research in. I don't know, we just randomly found them, but no. This was the original place in episode 15 as well, that makes a lot more sense. It's just their, like, base. Their, like, local HQ. Takes a bit of time for him to say something. Like, five second passes, we're just staring, and then he's like, Oh, hello, I've been waiting for you, believer in love. Love as in Satala, right? The love for Satala. You stink of the witch's scent. You must be one of us. Are you a believer in love? I am Sin Archbishop. Betrugus Romani Conti. And then we actually say, please let us join. Betrugus gets so shocked. He's so overwhelmed with feelings of happiness. He's in joy. And then the mental gymnastics he does to justify how he's being slothful is, oh my god, I cannot believe there was such a devout believer out there. It is due to my sloth that I wasn't able to find you until now. And then he beats his head in against the fucking rock. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> he's so crazy. I don't think he's really being slothful, but he's a very eccentric fella. And sometimes he does really just get mad at himself for unreasonable things. But yeah, I guess it's yeah, slothful, man. It's very slothful. You couldn't find Subaru until now. But every time, right, every time that we get closer to Betrugus and, you know, we're, we're, we're getting so close. The gospel always shows up, right? But here, to learn if this half-devil is a worthy vessel. Now, I don't think it's completely confirmed just yet if Emilia is the right vessel. Knowing how big brain of a show ReZero is, to have Emilia as a vessel might be a little bit too simple, so let's not count that out just yet, right? Put the witch into. Because remember, if she is, the witch will possess her. If not, discard her. So I'm already immediately... From the beginning, I was thinking that Amelia was basically some sort of sacrifice, a key vessel catalyst to awaken the witch. But there is a chance that she is not the right one. And if that is, that would be very shocking. Imagine somewhere out there, Amelia has a twin sister, another half-elf, with a pact with another fucking great spirit. Probably not. Makes no sense, but like, you never know, right? You never know with ReZero. Subaru figures out what the whole point of the ordeal is. Figures out what the purpose of Amelia is. Betrugius just gave us some ridiculously important intel. You're saying Amelia is just an afterthought? A convenient means to an end to you. Yes, she is. You monster. The word inscribed in the gospel tells of her love. More analogies and metaphors sometimes he just straight up tells us random shit that like doesn't make sense to me but the more i listen to his dialogue whenever he talks about the gospel it really does sound like a set of instructions right all of it guides my path right it's a fucking guide he reads the gospel i'm not sure to what extent this gospel has like how detailed each step is but it does sound like he is straight up taking the gospel as like a game playbook it's like a guide and saying, you know, I'm at this part, I need to do this thing. And Natsuki Subaru, you're not in my account, is what he said the last time Subaru like con confronted Betrugus. And this time he says something else too later on. What is that? Meteor. Oh, this is the stuff that we stole from, uh, you know, the other guy, right? So, boom. That makes sense. So this is FaceTime, right? So the Meteor, the fingers we're using, it was just a communication machine. It's not a clock, it's nothing to do with that. It's straight up showing Felix, meaning... Well, what is Felix talking with? There must be two separate ones, right? Think about it. How does that work? There must be two separate sets? Because if you only have one set here, what is Felix staring into right now? Felix must also have like a mirror thing, right? I'm assuming there is two sets. 
And then we shoot on Betrugis. And then Patras shows up out of nowhere and just destroys him. <laughs> and yes, these are the scene hands. And I refuse to believe that episode 15, we couldn't see it. So many people are saying light novel difference, web novel difference, manga difference. My still interpretation of episode 15 Unseen Hand during Rem Twister was we could not see it and that was intentional. The anime was telling us that we were not at the miasma level to see it. After the next regression, we were able to see it because the miasma stacked up. That is still my head canon. I don't care how much of a delusion you think it is. I don't care. That's what the anime is telling me, showing me. I'm just going to believe that. If that's not the case, the anime is misleading me and you can't be fucking mad at that. Fuck you. Oh, this part was great. We're now actually destroying Betrugus for his simping. Because remember, Betrugus is the biggest simp. Tier 3 sub to Satala. But she won't reply to his DMs. But to Natsuki Subaru, bro, we even know what her lipstick is. This makes Betrugus so upset, right? Exactly. We can see the witch anytime she literally grabs our heart. We're not really lying, right? How dare you speak as though you are intimate with the witch? We are. Everyone? And I'm not sure if the other archbishops are this devout in chasing the witch's love. We'll have to see the other archbishops and see their personality and how they act. Maybe it's just better to use, but it sounds like all cult members, they're using the gospel and it's a guide to help, you know, Satala. But everything is like a one-sided love. Just like how Puck said last episode to the other finger, right? When the finger was like crying and saying, Oh my god, my witch, my witch, looking at Amelia. And Puck said, it's a one-sided love. It does seem like it, right? Satala has basically created a cult of simps that all want her love. And all the simps are following the gospels to try to reach her love and try to reawaken her. But she's too busy fucking around with Natsuki Subaru. Why? That is still the biggest mystery of all. Why the Witch of Envy cares about this loser 17-year-old neat. But if the time travel power is part of our power, and if we're going to assume that she gave him the regression, maybe there's a possibility that it's some sort of, again, like, what's it called? Some Doctor Strange shit, you know, people with time, uh, time travel shit. You can see different timelines and all different possibilities, and she saw how sick Natsuki Subaru was and how important he is. That's why she gave him the powers. Maybe that could be one theory, but right now with what we have, I fail to recognize why Satala gives a fuck about Natsuki Subaru. Like, he's cool during these moments, but like, do you really think that an ancient witch like that suddenly has the hots for a random fucking 17-year-old neat from Japan? That part, it does not make sense to me. She's grabbed my heart, oh yes, multiple times, fondled it even. I love it when Betteregu fucking loses it. This is such a funny scene. Him floating in the sky like this. So, two things here. The first is, when Mimi looks up, it's funny. Because no one can see it, and he looks like he's just floating. The second is, how does this actually work? Because he's using the unseen hand to make him fly. But where is the start of the unseen hand? Because usually it just comes out of his back, right? While you do see the hand, where is the beginning of the hand? You know what I mean? How, 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 how is this working? Because the hand is delivering him, right? The hand is fucking delivering him. But where is the root of the hand? Does it continues to fucking extend from the position from the beginning? Like, I don't know. From like here, right? The hand comes out from his back, right? It always comes from his back. Come on. And then, uh, somehow, where, where, does, where does the beginning of the hand? I guess it's still rooted there, and just the hand is continuously extending and just delivering Betrigis like this? I, I, that's the only way, right? The fetal position is funny as fuck. Mimi and TV look up, and they're like, what the hell are we looking at? Mimi TV's, you know, breath attack has always come in clutch. They're so cute, and look at him. He's such a memeable character. He is such a fucking memeable character. I love Betrigus so much, man. And I just have a feeling that he's gonna die by the end of the season. Tonight's episode is the finale. And Betrigus seems to be the final boss of, you know, Arc 3. So it's just like, man, I don't want him to die. He was, he was such a treat. I love this voice acting, but 
maybe there are some other archbishops later on that's on Beatrice's level as well in terms of entertainment. I still don't understand exactly how these cult members are so fast. Because, like, you know how I made the joke before about how do the cult members have, like, throwing knife lessons? I wonder how it works, you know, back at the witch's cult headquarters. Like, all the new recruits are taught how to throw these daggers in such a precise way, but if you look at it, they're running at the speed of Patrash at top speed. How are these dudes running on their feet, competing with the fucking land dragon Patrash? How? How, bro? These cult members are insane. Every one of them's base physical abilities are crazy. Ultimate fucking soldiers, man. The slot guy is back. He's about to have, you know, revenge against the slot cult member. That's pretty funny. And then the goal right now... Oh. If we're talking about nightmares, what are we talking about right here? Oh, this is a cool moment. My name is Natsuki Subaru. The silver hair of Amelia's knights. Self-proclaimed knight. Maybe Julius is going to give us a pass for that. I don't know anything about this pride stuff, but that's the only title I want, right? Again, the whole connection with are you pride? You have to be pride. The pride position is open. You know, you have so much of them, which is miasma. To Betrigus? How does this look? It must seem crazy. Betrigus has always assumed that Subaru was pride simply due to the thick stench of the witch's love. He's probably going crazy. We continue to deny our existence of pride. And boom, where are we? We're at the arc 2 cliff yep we let him out here and julius drops from the top for whatever reason the spirits you know uh dampen his fall damage i think that the spirit effect did seem like it reduced the momentum going down when Subaru jumped off he just dies but hey that's that's pretty cool that the spirits can be used to kind of like dampen the fall damage or julius is just so strong that his, his body is just, just, just so durable that the fall damage didn't matter. I'm going to assume it's a spirit. He didn't just raw dog that jump. I clearly saw a spirit, you know, aid the jump. But uh, if he did just raw dog it, damn, bro. His name is also so funny. Julius Juculius. Like, it's such a redundant name. Julius Juculius. There's another anime where every character's name is just like an alliteration. I forget exactly what anime that was. We've seen an anime recently where every character had a very redundant name. Where the first and last name was basically the same. I can't remember anymore. Let me know if you guys remember what I'm talking about. I am the kingdom sword that will slay you. It's looking like Julius will slay Betrigus. The whole plan is to lure me here. And Julius uses Necht. Oregairu? Absolutely, that's the one. Yep. Hikigaya Hachiman. Yep. Uh, fucking... Uh, I forget the other name. Yukinoshita Yukinon, right? Everyone has, like, first, last name is basically an alliteration and basically sounds the same. Julius Euclius sounds the same to me. There's some beautiful bromance going on between Julius and Natsuki Subaru. Yeah, they're a little bit syndicate with each other. Obviously, he beat his ass. But it was out of good intent. Remember, Julius sacrificed his career to take the heat off of Subaru to make him look like the lesser of the evils here. But, you know, it's, it's a rough start. It's probably one of the worst in first impressions ever. But we're slowly becoming bros. And we've become such bros that we're together. You need to... I trust you, right? Because Subaru can see the unseen hands. And by using Nect, they're like one together. All their sensory shit is together, I think. Funny how Betrigus literally just waits for the monologue to end, which is just an anime cliche. It's not that big of a deal. And right over here, how does he dodge? Necked. Subaru's eyes are Julius's eyes. Al Clarista? I'm not sure. I think that's just like a, a sword technique. Al Clarista. That's a magic. He said Al. Al Huma. Ul Huma. Al Clarista? Don't know exactly what Clarista is. But we can clearly see the Spirit Knights doing Spirit Knight shit. We're connected together. Subaru's eyes are Yulis's eyes. I'm not... So it's just vision? Is that what's happening? Because like we learned that Nect connects the gates of people. It can, anyways, in the time where we dispersed Ram's Genjutsu. And by connecting the gates of everyone, have everyone communicate. It was possible to let everyone know what to do. Here, the gates are 
probably connected. And somehow our vision stimuli are also connected. We can see together. This part is interesting how they jump back together. I'm not sure if they're completely synchroed. I don't think they are. I think it's just their eyes, right? And then the rest of it is just Julius doing his fancy spirit night shit. My friend Natsuki Subaru, and the title is The Self-Proclaimed Knight. I'm the greatest knight. Now, is The Greatest Knight actually Julius' title? Because I thought that Reinhardt... Well... Reinhardt's Sword Saint. But he could also be the greatest knight. Because like, if you ask me, if the greatest knight is the strongest knight, it's the finest knight? Hmm, okay. We, elegant knight, right? I, I think Julius definitely is very elegant. Finest, for sure. Greatest sounds more... Like, strong. You know, it's like the strongest knight. And I don't think he's that. I, I think power scaling, it's Reinhardt and then it's... Marcos, right? Marcos is the captain of the Imperial Knights, which is actually Royal Knights. Reinhardt is technically the strongest. And Julius is like top three, maybe. Full of chivalry and gentleman-like uh, persona. But it's a beautiful friendship what's happening here. And it's looking like episode 25, the fine finale of ReZero, which is... How long is it? It's 27 minutes long. Damn, that's pretty fucking long, man. I was hoping that's going to be like a... Man, imagine the finale was also like an hour-long episode, like episode one, but it's looking like the finale is going to be Julius and Subaru slaying Betrugus, and everything's going to be happy. Arc 3 will close, and we'll have some sort of setup into Season 2. And that's it for me. I will see you on the next one.